And I'm going to pray for you. Oh, thank yeah, you. Father, we're just really grateful for this opportunity, this privilege to receive the word through your servant, Dwayne. As I've already prayed for our hearts, we pray that you would fill Dwayne with your power, your spirit, your love, that he may preach your word faithfully and that he would be overjoyed when in a couple of weeks I can share with him the fruit of what he's preached here. So God, do a great work today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, it's always an honor if a church lets me come back. And I, I think I've... Uh, I'll use this... Into, yeah, this way... I'm, I'm getting at the age, uh, Pastor Ted was reckoning me, perhaps I use this, but I'm at the age where my eyes aren't quite what they used to, and this is the one, since I am taller, I can adjust to what I see. <laughs> but um, it's always a pleasure when I can come back and visit a church, and I just want to say to uh, the worship team, thank you. Uh, you blessed me through your work and putting that uh, time together. Uh, Today we're going to look at this idea of lessons from a life of ministry. It's going to be about a man named Elijah. We're looking at a couple different chapters, 17 through 19, even a little bit in chapter 16. So it's spread out. But I want you to think about this title. I'm not sure how I feel about the title. I don't know if I should admit that. But lessons from a life of ministry. It's well. I did one of those word uh, what are you, thesaurus searches for ministry and minister, and I came up with a whole bunch of things like ministry. They had to do with like bureaucracy, you know, the ministry of defense or something like that. So it was like department, office, bureau, agency, organization. And then if you do the same thing for minister, you come up with all these things like priest, preacher, reverend, nun. And neither of those ideas was really getting what I'm thinking about today. I don't know if office, Microsoft Office, the source, understands the biblical idea of ministry, that it's not an organization and it's not just reserved for a few people. All Christians, of course, were called to be ministers. And so the title is left at as it is. Part of me was thinking, though, maybe I want something a little more exciting, you know, like uh, ready for impact or something like that, or, or how to change the world. But today what we're going to do is look at this man, Elijah, and see how God used him in a number of different situations. I think there's some lessons that we can look at uh, that will apply to our, our lives as well. And, and so think about where do you minister? Maybe just take a moment right now and think about where is your ministry? You go to different places than I go. You work with different people than I work with. And it doesn't have to be an official position, but God's called you to minister. Perhaps you're to your neighbors, your children, your parents, your co-workers. Some ministries are through the church. Some are, some are through your community. Some are, are just by where you go and eat and hang out with, with your friends. But God's called you to minister for Him in those situations. And as we look uh, through these uh, chapters on the uh, life of Elijah, there's a whole number of lessons that we could... Uh, gather out of them and so we'll, 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 you may have said oh, I've heard that story before but I learned this and that's hopefully true because we can't take everything out of these chapters uh, but there's a few important things I'd like us to think about and maybe just to give you a little bit of background, this prophet Elijah is uh, ministering for God. He's, he's working in the northern kingdom. Uh, there's a man named King Ahab, his wife Queen Jezebel, perhaps the worst king and queen ever in, in, in Israel. And well, here, let me just read what the Bible says about them. Maybe that'll be a good way to start. This is in the end of chapter 16, kind of leading into to where we are. This is 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria. That's the, uh, you may, that word may stick in your mind from New Testament times. This is Old Testament times. That's the capital of the northern kingdom. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethel, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In other words, Ahab is setting, and his wife Jezebel are setting up these, these uh, pagan places of worship within Israel. He married Jezebel, who came from this other area where Baal was the main god. 
And she introduces it and, 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 and develops the worship of Baal in Israel. And so to get their attention, God gives Elijah this well, difficult assignment. He says, go tell the king it's not going to rain anywhere in the land until I say it does. <laughs> That's God's message to, 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 through Elijah to the king. So Elijah gives that message, which you could imagine isn't received very well. And then God says, okay, now go leave this area. Go hide. And this will be in chapter 17 is what's happening. God says, leave and hide. And while Elijah's gone, God provides for him and protects him. And that leads us to what we're going to look at just for a little bit more. This is one of the ideas I want you to see today. Sometimes, whatever ministry you're in, it seems small. Do it well. It may seem small, but, but do it well. What happened is God sent Israel now to this other land. Well, let me read it. Sometime later, the brook dried up. That's where God had been caring for Elijah. The brook dried up, so there's no more water because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed the widow there to supply you with food. So where... God is sending Elijah right now. You see Sidon? That's where Queen Jezebel's dad had lived. So God's sending Elijah out of Israel to this pagan land where they worship Baal, where the current queen who wants to kill him is from, which is kind of interesting. He's, he's, sending, he's sending Elijah basically to her hometown, her home area, and saying, you stay there for a while. Now, the reason God is, is taking the rain away from Israel is because they're worshiping Baal. But God sends his prophet to this place, this city, and he's prepared a widow there, a widow who's poor, who's literally starving. Elijah comes and meets her and says, can you give me some food? And she says, I'm gathering sticks to bake basically my last meal for me and my kid, my son, and then we're going to die. And he says, well, first, make something for me. <laughs> it's kind of a difficult request. But she does it. And God uh, does this incredible miracle where the flour keeps showing up and the oil to make the cakes and the breads keeps showing up as long as they need it. Not just for that day, but indefinitely. And Elijah stays there with them. God provides miraculously for them. It's this beautiful story of God blessing someone from outside of Israel, this widow. And on top of that, while Elijah is there, he's there for an extended period of time. While he's there, her son dies. And God raises this son to life. It's this incredible miracle, and to be, it's, I believe, the very first time in Scripture, first time recorded in the Bible, that someone from God raises a dead person to life. This is the very first one. What's interesting to me is, think about it. How many people even noticed it? How many people even cared that this boy who had been dead was living? He, he, he's the son of this poor lady in this faraway place who has nothing. Now, if I had been God, which I hope you realize that that would be a problem right now, but, but if I had been God, that's not the way I would do it. I would, if I'm going to go to all the trouble of raising somebody from the dead, I would, I would want more people to see it, more people to be amazed by it. That's not what God did for whatever his reasons. That's not how he worked here. But he had Elijah in this very small ministry. But Elijah was still doing it well. Elijah had been ministering, I guess you could say ministering, but at least speaking to the king of Israel. He had gone from you know, declaring this message of God in front of the king of Israel. Now he's working with this widow and her son and just kind of hanging out. Probably, bare, uh, you know, he, he gets, well, they have flour and oil and they have that, it seems like, every day. <laughs> He's not in any visible, uh, public, great ministry where he's receiving any sort of recognition. It's kind of like, let's say you were working with the president or some powerful figures, and then you move down and while well, you're doing well, whatever the rest of the, the things we do. 
Whatever you do in ministry, maybe you work with children. Maybe you're the person who sets up here. Maybe you're the one who drives people here. Maybe you're the one who parks. The next week is it wherever you have to park and walk here. That's a ministry. Maybe you provide the food or the music. Maybe you're a parent. Maybe you're the one who opens your home for a home fellowship. Some of the things we do don't seem very big at all. They seem very small. But it's still important to do them well. And that's what Elijah did. He wasn't looking for recognition now. He's just being obedient. God said, go here. Stay with this widow and her son. That's what I want you to do during this period of time. And he did it well. Small things matter. Maybe you're a mom or dad. <coughs> Nobody notices. You know how you got a Mother's Day card and maybe a Father's Day card each year, if you're lucky, you know. But that ministry is, is important. My mom and dad, they ministered to me when I was a kid. It changed my life. The lady at the children's Bible club after school where I became a Christian, that, that ch changed my life. Small ministry done well is incredibly important. Do you do those things? Sometimes ministry is small. Do it well. Maybe at your work. Do your co-workers see a difference in you? Do they see that you're faithful even in those little things or do they see you cutting the corners? Jesus was involved in small ministry on a number of occasions. One time, he met a woman, we call her the, the Samaritan woman, right? The woman at the well, the woman at Samaria. Remember that where that's from? This is hundreds of years after Elijah. King Ahab, his capital was in the city of Samaria. This is in that general region. Now Jesus is back ministering in that area. He meets this Samaritan woman. It would have been an easy ministry, I guess if you want to call it that, to overlook why he's a Jewish man, she's a Samaritan woman. Generally, they don't interact with one another. But he saw an opportunity, and he spoke with her. And that led to this life-changing conversation for her, life-changing realization about who Jesus was. And she went back to her village and said, come see this man. And as a result, many Samaritans believed in Jesus. You could say even from one perspective, all of Jesus' ministry was relatively small. He focused on 12 disciples. That's where his focus was. That's where he poured his time, his energy. And then 12, that's like maybe your home group Bible study or your Sunday school class. That's, that's where he focused his ministry. It wasn't a mega church. It wasn't a parachurch ministry. It was a small group. And God uses it to change the world. Sometimes ministry is small. Do it well. There's a, a famous... I don't know if it's a poem or a piece of writing called One Solitary Life, and it's talking about Jesus and said he never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never had a family or owned a home, he didn't go to college, he never lived in a big city, he never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. And a little bit later it says, all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this search as much as that one solitary life. Sometimes ministry seems small. That's where you may be today. That's a wonderful place to be. Do it well. Follow God and do what's well, what he called you to do. On the other hand, sometimes things happen and ministry seems big and incredible things happen. And that's what happens to Elijah a little bit later. What happens is now God says, okay, it's time to leave the widow. Go back to King Ahab, Queen Jezebel. Tell them you've got this plan or God has this plan. And they call for this, this big meeting of the people, the false prophets, literally hundreds and hundreds of false prophets. And Elijah, it's, uh, it's on Mount Carmel. And sometimes uh, God allows his people to have this big opportunity. Elijah is going to be speaking to the whole nation. It's no longer just his small ministry with the widow and her son. Now he's going to be confronting the king, hundreds of false prophets. He's going to be doing it publicly in front of many people. 
from the nation of Israel. Here's what, it, what the Bible says. 1 Kings chapter 18. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. That's after Elijah told them to do, to do that. The prophets there he's speaking about are these false prophets. Uh, I think 400, uh, 850 of them. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. So there's going to be this, this contest, you could say. This is an incredibly big opportunity, uh, an opportunity for the whole nation to see who truly is God. There's this challenge, and the challenge is this. The, the false prophets will set up their altar. Later, Elijah will set up an altar, but they won't light it. And those each will pray for God to send fire down from heaven. And the one that prays and God answers, that's the true God. And that's the challenge. And so they spend hours with the people of Israel watching the, these false prophets. And they're, 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 they're dancing around, they're shouting, they're even slashing themselves in order to attract their God's attention. And nothing happens. Finally, after hours of this, it's Elijah's turn. And he simply rebuilds the altar of the Lord. He has these 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he has them pour 12 large jars of water over the altar and the sacrifice. Now imagine this is during a drought. 12 large containers of water. That's something special. And they gather that. And he says, pour over and over. Four, four at a time, three times 12. The water's running down the sides. And then Elijah prays. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. The ending part is so important. So, that means this is the reason they're doing it. So these people will know. What Elijah wants the people to know is that you, Lord, are God. You, Yahweh, Jehovah, you're the, you're the one that revealed yourself to Moses at the burning bush. And then, of course, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel. You are the true God. And God answers. There's this fire that comes down from heaven. And it completely consumes the sacrifice. It's a very public victory. It's a very big victory. He had had the small victories and small ministry with the widow and her son. Now there's this very big, there's this very public victory. There's a business trainer named Stephen Covey uh, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a fascinating uh, uh, study if you ever want to go through that. One of the principles in it is that private victories often come before public victories. In other words, who we are in private, that affects who we are in public. In some ways, I believe it also small ministry, sometimes when we do it well, that may lead to bigger ministries. When those big ministries come, make sure to point people to Jesus. Point them to God. That's what he's called us to do. Now, big and small are kind of relative. For me, this is a big ministry. If Billy Graham was here, this would be kind of a small ministry for him. He's used to, well, he had been used to preaching, you know, to thousands and thousands. So big and small is relative, but, but what do you do with the opportunities God gives to you? Uh, there's a woman uh, who was kidnapped some years ago. And uh, there's a, she was kidnapped by this murder suspect who's trying to get away. He has her. They end up talking and talking while she's uh, confined and he's trying to figure out what to do. She talks to him about this book she's been reading. It's a Christian book about finding purpose and meaning in life, of course, through Jesus. They have this powerful conversation. Sometime later, though, uh, she's freed. The police come free or he's taken away. Now who shows up? The national news. What does she do? This woman who wasn't a public figure, but all of a sudden is thrust into a very public situation. And she uses that opportunity to share what God has done for her, it's, uh, how God had used this Christian book in her life, how God can give purpose in life. It's the same message she shared with the, the man who had kidnapped her. 
now she's sharing with the nation. She was unexpectedly given this big stage and she used it to point people to Jesus. It's like what Elijah in his prayer at the very end, he says, so these people will know that you, are, you Lord, are God. That's what he wants. That's what God wants to do through you. Small ministry, do it well. Large ministry, definitely make sure you point people to God. Now, when we say that ministry can sometimes be big, it can be big in a couple different ways. It can be big in size, but also sometimes in the situation. And so maybe I'm mixing these up a little bit too much, but you can really have a small ministry, but every now and then you get some big opportunity within that ministry, a, a meaningful opportunity. That, that, that's perhaps, they can, it's a big moment, perhaps, within a small ministry. And we should take the, make the most of those opportunities that God gives to us. One of these, I think, happens uh, time is we get in a conversation, someone raises a question. And maybe you've had this happen, and you know, okay, from their question or the way the discussion is going, you could go one of two ways. You could take it and use it as an opportunity to share about God, or very easily, you could just kind of steer the topic back to the sports and the weather and whatever else you usually talk about. We each have those opportunities. They come along periodically. And, and they're not so dramatic. The person maybe that even you're talking to doesn't realize it. But in your mind you realize, okay, from what's just been said, this is a great opportunity for me to share about Jesus. But it's also a great opportunity for me to talk about, you know, whatever we usually talk about. It's a big opportunity. What do we do with it? Sometimes these opportunities come when we... Or when people have transitions in their life. Maybe somebody moves to a new home. You're invited over. You can maybe bring a housewarming gift. You can also pray, pray a blessing on this home. Like this would be a place where God brings peace and His love. Maybe when you hear about a wedding, a friend of yours is getting married. You're going to say, oh, let me pray for you. Someone who's passed away. Maybe you're allowed to speak uh, in a, in a, among a group of people. Maybe you're just asked to move some furniture or cook some food or write a note of encouragement. It may look like a small opportunity, a small ministry, but in reality, it's a powerful one. And do we seize it? Don't miss out on those. God brings them to us. Jesus had a number of large ministries. He fed 5,000 people, but he didn't just feed 5,000 people. Later, he told some of those people, hey, you know who the true bread of life is? He pointed people to who he truly was. He was speaking to the crowds and the Sermon on the Mountain. He ends by talking about the wise and the foolish builders. He says, the wise man is the one who puts his words into practice. And so Jesus took that opportunity when he's talking to the crowds to point people to who he truly is. When ministry is big, take that opportunity. Point people to Jesus. Now, one of the things you have to realize uh, when we read this story, it's very clear with Elijah and the false prophets, it's a spiritual battle. It, there's going to be some physical fighting in it. I won't get into all that today. But it's most importantly this spiritual battle, helping the people realize which God is true. We see this in uh, what we just were talking about. Uh, and as part of Elijah's prayer, he said, Answer me, Lord, answer me. So those people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. In other words, it worked. Elijah had been pointing the people to, to God and then they realized He is the true God. They had seen him act. He brought the fire down from heaven. But notice this. Elijah needed God to come through, right? Elijah couldn't make the fire come. Elijah, he couldn't bring the miracle. He couldn't do the miracle. It's God doing the miracle. And Elijah is just relying on God's power. And in any of our ministries, that's something you have to remember. It's God's power working through you. 
Elijah's very name, it means the Lord is my God. That's what his name means. The Lord is my God. And so his, his, true, his whole ministry, the essence of his ministry, is he's trying to contrast the true God with these false gods. I, I, I hope you know this. I'm sure you know it here. The Bible isn't so much about religion. It's not so much about, oh yeah, I'll talk to a lot of people and they'll kind of say, oh yeah, this religion, that religion. Uh, the Bible's saying this, there's a true God. Elijah's doing that to his people. The other people, all those false prophets, they had a religion, a very powerful one, something they certainly believed in. And God's coming and saying, no, it's not true. It's not who he truly is. And we need to remember that, yes, we work. Yes, we obey God. We try to do our very best to worship team practices. But it's God's power, God's might that brings any results. The truth is we can't change anybody's heart. Now, God uses us in the process. And it's incredible to be involved in that process. But God's the one who changes it. We need to rely upon him. A while ago, I was listening to someone teach about the importance of prayer. And I don't know if this ever happens to you while somebody's preaching that your mind starts to wander. Anybody's mind wandering right now? I don't know. But my mind started to wander. And this importance of prayer. I said, oh yeah. I started thinking, wow, we have an extraordinary God and we're ordinary people. And this phrase kind of came to me. I don't think it was mentioned in the sermon, but the phrase was this, ordinary people, extraordinary God. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And of course, this is, I think, during the sermon, I'm thinking, oh, yeah. I was thinking, well, that would be a great name for a church, OPEG, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. <laughs> and so, I, you know, later I got home and I Googled it. Yeah, I was, yeah, sure enough. Somebody always, I'm, I'm never original. I think I'm original, but you just Google search something, and it's always, always there already, it seems like. Somebody's thought of it, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. Yeah. Um, but that's, so I'm not so original, but it's true. We're just regular folks. But we have an extraordinary God. And He works in us and through us when we rely on Him. A great example of this was in the New Testament. Uh, there's Peter and John, and, and they're called before the religious leaders. This is after Jesus returned up to heaven. And the Bible says this about them. When they, and that's the uh, religious leaders, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's kind of like, oh, they're realizing, oh, hey, what happened to these guys? How are these guys like turning the whole city upside down and doing these amazing things? And it's almost like they go, oh, they had been with Jesus. Wouldn't that be cool if uh, for Orange County Chinese Evangelical Church, people would say, hey, they're just regular folks. Do I get, did I get the name right? Christian. Ah. Oh, I knew it was OCCEC, Orange County Christian Evangelical Church. Great. I'm sorry. I just knew it was a lot of C's always. <laughs> um, yeah, wouldn't they say, hey, they're just ordinary people? <coughs> oh, they've been with Jesus. Yeah. It's, it's their middle name, Christian. Yeah. Orange County Christian Evangelical Church. They've been with Jesus. They're regular people. But now it makes sense. Jesus' new ministry was a spiritual battle, too. It was one day after a long day of ministry, teaching and then healing. The next morning, we know what he does. He gets up early and he prays. He knew it's a spiritual battle. And I'd like to do this for two minutes right now. Would you be willing to do this? We've been talking about ministry is small. Do it well. Ministry is big. Point people to God. We were remembering that ministry is a spiritual battle. I still have some more, one more point to go, but right now what I'd like you to do, would you maybe by yourself or if someone next to you take one, two minutes and just pray for whatever ministry you're in, whatever God's put you in. Maybe you're a parent, a teacher, maybe you're the driver here, the one who cooks. Pray that God would help you to do that small ministry well, that big ministry pointing people to God. Just be either by yourself or with someone. Just take a moment and pray.
Lord Jesus, may we rely on your power. Thank you for the privilege of ministering for you. May you minister through us. And glorify your, yourself and build your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. One last thought as we finish up. Maybe this is where you are today. Ministry, does it ever feel like a failure to you? My name is Dwayne. Uh, I've heard this joke my whole life. Knock, knock, who's there? Dwayne? Dwayne who? Dwayne the bath, I'm drowning. Well, actually, the, the original one here, it said drowning. I change it. How I usually hear it is people say, I'm drowning. And so I've heard that joke my whole life. Dwayne the bathtub instead of drain. I'm drowning. I guess it's new for you. I've heard it so many times, I think I don't even have to explain it. But um, yeah, it's just one of the things that happens when your name is Dwayne. <laughs> what I want you to know is, so when I think of the word draining, ministry can be a draining experience, I think of this joke. And um, ministry can be a draining experience. It can feel like a failure. Um, if you've ever read a newsletter from an honest missionary, You've probably seen this and felt it. They, they struggle. It's hard. In some places of the world, especially the, 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 the spiritual battle that's there is real. It there's, creates tensions sometimes within the missionary team, within the missionary families. It seems like they're dedicating your life to something that you're not seeing the results. Sometimes ministry is like that. It seems like you're a bathtub and you're just being drained out. We're called to be filled with the Spirit. And that's kind of, you know, like this. It's a command. It's this ongoing thing. We're supposed to be ongoingly filled with the Spirit. Uh, it's passive. And so God fills us. We receive it. But it doesn't feel like that all the time. And you may just feel empty. What's fascinating to me is after Elijah had this incredible spiritual victory, think about this, in front of the nation of Israel, the other prophets are proved to be false prophets. In front of the nation of Israel and the king, God sends down fire from heaven and, and explodes this altar and this sacrifice. He's proved to, to be the, the true one. What's amazing about that is after that great spiritual victory, he has this incredibly deep physical and emotional collapse. And he's afraid. Queen Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to get you. And uh, he flees, and he runs and runs and runs. He flees for his life. He goes down to this desert. He lies down. He says he's had enough, and he prays to die. That's Elijah the prophet. He's praying, God, I have had enough. And it's so beautiful. God, God knows his weaknesses. He knows our limitations. And it says God knows he needs rest and food for the journey, and God provides it for him. Two times. Later, Elijah ends up in a cave, and God speaks to him there. There he went into a cave and spent the night. The Lord appears to Elijah, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? That's God's message, or his question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Here's what Elijah says. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So God says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah complains, I've been zealous, I've been working hard. Nothing's happening. I've been ineffective. The people are rejecting you. They're killing your prophets. I'm the only one left. And God, we're going to see God comes and speaks to him. And he, he, this is the, the, the story, you remember, when, God, when, when there's this powerful wind and it says God's not in the wind. And then God, there's this earthquake and God's not in the earthquake. There's this fire. God's not in the fire. But then God speaks in this gentle whisper. He asked the same question. Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, I think, but the, basically the same thing. I've been doing all these things, and it's not working. The people aren't responding. They're rejecting you. They're killing the prophets. I'm the only one left. God, 
does this incredible thing for Elijah. He does these three things. God tells him specifically, okay, here's what I want you to do. I won't get into all those right now, but he gives Elijah specific assignments. He lets Elijah know that God is still at work, and he lets Elijah know that Elijah is not alone. There are some others Elijah doesn't know about who still worship God. God gives these instructions. He shows he's in control. Even though it doesn't seem like it to Elijah, from his perspective, God has kept this faithful remnant. In other words, what God is reminding Elijah is that God wins. The spoiler word is this. Jesus wins. If you don't know that, I want you to know it. That's the end of the story. You, you, when you fast forward to whenever Jesus returns, he wins. His kingdom cannot fail. Ministry can feel like a failure. The victory is already won. It's already won. From our perspective, we may not get it. We may crash. Sometimes after this big public victory, we have these crashes. We're just physically, emotionally drained. Sometimes after a stressful day at work or with the family. Sometimes it could be something bad or sometimes it's something good. It doesn't always matter. But the adrenaline wears off and our bodies collapse. Remember what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? There's a connection between those things. We're whole people. And sometimes when our, well, our minds and our strength and our hearts are weak, there's a weakness spiritually. There's an old joke, pastors should never resign on Monday. Never resign on Monday. Why? Because Sundays is the big day for pastors, and we just kind of crash sometimes on Mondays. You may have a situation where you realize whatever day, you know, whatever it's Friday or whatever day, yeah, this is a day when I'm worn out. I'm taking care of the kids or leading the children's program or, or driving people or cooking or working at work, whatever it is. Jesus wins. Remember that. It may feel like a failure, but we know being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We get, we get discouraged by ourselves. We don't change. We get discouraged by the others. They don't change. Our situations, they don't become what we want them to. And, and it, it, we're saying, God, it, nothing's mattering. It's not making any difference. Parents, you may feel discouraged. Are your children really maturing? Young people, you may be discouraged. Will I ever make a difference in the world? Many of you like share the gospel with somebody or serve somebody, but you see little re terms of results. What I want you to know is Jesus wins. And he's called us in small ministries, do it well, and large ministries, point people to Jesus. And what God does for Elijah in this situation, twice God provides food and rest for him. Jesus did the same for his, uh, his disciples. Once they had been out ministering, they come back. And he says, come, come by your, with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Interesting thing, when they tried to get away for some rest, there was more ministry that showed up. They had the, Jesus fed the 5,000. But Jesus knows your weaknesses. He knows you get tired. For some of you today, this is a sermon about servanthood, serving. The main application may be get some rest. It, it's possible that that's what it is. And if so, hear God's voice to you. But remember in that that God wins. Our feelings don't negate God's power, God's plan. We may not know how or when or why. Anything good can come out of ourselves, our, the others, our situation. But know that Jesus will come again. His kingdom can't fail. God takes our small ministries, our big ministries, whatever, and He works through them. Today we've been seeing just four simple things. Sometimes ministry is small, do it well. Maybe that's where you are today. Sometimes, maybe a few of you may have this incredible opportunity. Hey, point people to Jesus. Or be ready when that opportunity comes, if it's big. Always remember it's a spiritual battle. You need God's power to do it, to make any difference. When we got here today, we saw some, uh, some men in orange vests directing the traffic. You'd say, hey, you can do that without God's power. To truly serve in God's power, whatever our ministry is, rely on His power. It can feel like a failure. The victory is already won. 
There's a man named uh, James Packer. He said this about servants and service in the Bible. What a servant is, is, is someone who is not at his own disposal, but is his master's purchased property. As we're called to serve others, we're, we're God, we do what God tells us to do. And then he says something that's even harder. He says, what work does Christ set for his servants to do? This is what he says. The way that they serve him, he tells them, is by becoming the slaves of their fellow servants and being willing to do literally anything, however costly, irksome, or undignified, in order to help them. I don't know if I've ever used the word irksome in a sermon. But that's what he's saying. If you want to know what God, how, how he's called you to serve, you do whatever is costly, irksome, undignified in order to help your fellow believers. And then he goes on and says this. This is a challenging one for me. When the New Testament speaks of ministering to the saints, it means not primarily preaching to them, but devoting time, trouble, and substance to giving them all the practical help possible. That's what the Bible says. So what I'm doing today, I get to sit in an honored place, honored, yeah. Real New Testament service is when we're doing these things to care for God's people. And so the question is this. How can you tell if you have a servant's heart? How can you tell if you have a servant's heart? By the way you react when you're treated like one, when you're treated like a servant. When someone treats you like a servant, how do you react? You say, hey, who made you boss? <laughs> who made you king? That's what we used to say as kids. Yeah, your big brother says, who made you the boss of the house? Yeah, you're not boss over me. Huh? How, you, how do you react when you're treated like a servant? Jesus has called us to serve. To do that, the thing that gets in my way of, not, of, of doing that most of the time is, well, I don't want to. My heart. As we close today, just let's pray that God would give us his hearts to do small ministry, large ministry, whatever it is for him. Let's pray. Lord God, you've blessed us. You came to serve. The Son of Man came to this earth. To seek and to serve those who are lost. What an incredible thought. Now you call us to take up our crosses and follow you. And sometimes that leads us to places where nobody notices. Lord, I believe here at, at this church, you've put people just like that who serve faithfully, willingly behind the scenes. Bless and encourage them today. Some of them may need a rest. We pray that you would provide that for them. And at times you give us bigger opportunities. May we take those in our conversations, in whatever way it is, Lord, to point people to you. May we always rely upon your power. And even on those days when, like Elijah, we say, we want to give up. Nothing's working. May we remember always that you win. The victory is won because, Jesus, you went to the cross, you died, and you rose again. And one day you shall return as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' your name we pray. Amen.